Labour Party has today promised a major overhaul of the NHS if they come into power at the general election. The Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, has promised an extra £1.1 billion worth of funding, but only on the condition that the health service starts operating through the weekends to slash those waiting lists. He says he's up for the fight against what he calls middle-class lefties who disagree with him. The party's plans also include bringing in the private sector to help cut waiting times and digitising huge amounts of paperwork by improving the NHS app. It would allow customers to get notifications, or patients to get notifications about GP availability and direct access to their medical records. Sakir Starmer has admitted the health service is on its knees and insisted Labour is the party to fix it. The proposal that we make, the Red Book, um, which is what every parent will be familiar with when they have a baby's Red Book, which has all the details uh, for a baby's health. We're here at the maternity unit. We want to make that digital because everybody has that Red Book knows that uh, it can get lost, it can get forgotten, all the details have to be re-entered, it wastes a huge amount of time. And this is an example of the sort of reform that we want in the NHS. Obviously, everybody will know the NHS is absolutely on its knees. If we're elected into government, if we're privileged enough to come into government, we have to pick the NHS up, put it on its feet, but we also may need to make it fit for the future, and that's where the reform comes in. Well, joining me now in the studio is journalist and commentator Mike Buckley and Aubrey Allegretti, the chief political correspondent at The Times. I mean, I think we can all agree that the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, West Streeting have a point. That we know that the Labour Party's on its knees. We know that the waiting lists are the worst. Not the Labour ever. Party on its knees. The NHS. Oh, did I say <laughs> no? The Labour Party is definitely not on its knees <laughs> in, in the polls at the moment. Quite the opposite. Thank you, all. Right? I didn't realise this. <laughs> yes, the NHS is on its knees. Exactly. Waiting lists are appalling. But we also know that one of the main reasons for that is that there aren't enough doctors and nurses in the NHS. So it seems to me that them promising to you know, open up uh, the operating theatres at the weekends and say, you know, off you go, do lots more operations. You can't do that unless you've got more surgeons and more nurses and more um, people to do the anaesthetics and so on. That is absolutely true. We do need something to do something to increase the numbers of doctors and nurses in this country and midwives as well. That's part the, 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 that the fact that we don't have enough is because we haven't trained enough over 13 yeah. years, 14 years now of this government. So one of the things the next government is going to have to do, wherever it is, most likely Labour in current circumstances, is start training more people. Unfortunately, we are also in the short term going to have to bring more people in from overseas. Now, this government, the current government, has been desperately trying to do that. But one of the problems we have at the moment is because we don't pay as much as people pay, other countries pay internationally, you've got people coming, staying for a short amount of time, you know, three or four years, and then leaving in quite large numbers. So we still have huge gaps. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I wholeheartedly agree on, Aubrey, is that for the last, I mean, as long as I've been covering politics, which is 30 years, there's been this conspiracy of silence around the NHS, where you will go into a room full of experts, whether they be you know, King's Fund or opposition politicians or you know, people from the NHS or, or the Department of Health, and they will all say, you know, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, we need to get more funding, we need to change the way it does this. And then they will come out of a Chatham House type environment in front of TV cameras and say, you know, completely opposite, say the NHS is marvellous, we're not going to touch it, you know, we're not going to you know, play around fundamentally because they're so worried that that's the way to lose votes. Mm. I think what's really interesting is to look at the sort of levels of public satisfaction with the NHS, which in 2010 were as high as 70%. And according to the King's Fund in their most recent survey, have dipped to about 25%. So I think there is now almost cross party cross sort of public consensus that the NHS isn't on a sustainable footing and that is probably the sort of period the starting point that everybody agrees with now politically it's obviously very interesting what West Streeting is trying to do today he's been doing stuff like this for a while now I think even back at Labour's conference in October he was making similar points but the fact that he's made this intervention in the Sun newspaper which obviously some Labour politicians in the past wouldn't have wanted to do the fact that he's taking on people on his own side by calling the middle class left does show that Labour thinks that it can risk pushing away some of those groups of people in order to attract voters who do think that the current structures of the NHS do need a rethink. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting lines in the article was uh, where he said, the NHS is a service, not a shrine. Because, of course, that's been the accusation in the past that politicians have sort of prayed at the altar of, of the NHS and then, you know, done all the 
thank you to doctors and nurses and yes, we want to give you more money and so on without saying actually the system needs to be ch fundamentally changed. But do you think, how far do you think he would go? We know that Wes Streeting has looked at Australia and Ireland where, for instance, you do have to pay uh, for GP's appointments and so on. Do you think he could get rid of the free at the point of delivery, Mike? I think that's almost impossible in the UK because it's such a, a key concern for the public that they are able to access GP services, the NHS, you know, fundamentally, you know, turn up at A&E without showing a credit card. You can't really see that changing. So I think it's more than likely it will be continued to be funded through general taxation, which is something that I would support because there's lots of evidence showing that particularly poorer people, obviously, don't approach a GP, don't go to A&E, don't, don't approach health services full stop if they feel that they can't afford it or if they're scared of what it might turn into in terms of an expense. You know, even a £10 fee to go to a GP is a significant disincentive to people at the, at the bottom of the pile. So I think it will continue to be free at the point of need. But I think you're right. The fact that Wes is talking very ambitiously about the reform that's going to be needed to put this on a sustainable footing is good. And I think it's good for the future. And it's, but it is also a strong message you're sending out politically. It's actually easier for the Labour Party to be quite radical with the NHS than for the Conservative Party because people always expect the Conservative Party to be not to look after the NHS. It's one of the areas when you know, the public's polled, you know, who do you trust most with the NHS? They don't normally say the Conservative Party. So the Conservative Party is constantly trying to reassure the public that actually they do care about the NHS, whereas the Labour Party can be bold because it's sort of seen as their baby. You know, it's like we can criticise our own parents, but no one else can. It's mm. sort of that idea. Or... I think that's absolutely right. There is kind of probably more trust and goodwill from the public that Labour's reform of the NHS would sort of keep to its roots, if you like, whereas, um, you know, successful attacks, I would say, by the Labour Party on the Conservative Party over a very long period of time have always sought to criticise the Conservatives and accuse them of sort of bringing privatisation closer. I suppose um, the issue is that there will be a point where the rubber reaches the road and they do have to make these sorts of decisions as and when they get into government. And so it's all very well sort of talking the talk now, but you have to be prepared to make those tough decisions and negotiate with NHS bosses and senior DHSC officials, the health department officials, because they might be pushing back. And of course, Mike, there are still negotiations ongoing between the government and health unions, you know, junior doctors and so mm. on, who've, who've been on strike. Many people suggesting that one of the reasons that those strikes um, haven't been settled is because those unions are sort of dragging their heels and waiting for a Labour government to come in, thinking that perhaps the Labour government will uh, be more ameliant to their demands. But many people are saying, actually, they might get a nasty shock. They may well get asked to drop because once we have the election and we've got a Labour government, there isn't suddenly loads more money to spend. No. You know, the public finances are in a real state, it's possibly the worst state they've been in modern times because of the multiple mistakes made by this government, of course. So Labour isn't going to get in and suddenly find a truckload of cash and think we can now give this to junior doctors or to railway drivers or to yeah. tube drivers or anybody else, you know. So... I doubt that there will be a much bigger, if any bigger, offer on the table. But it is certainly the case that the funding of the NHS is going to have to be taken care of, you know, at some point in the future. I mean, under New Labour, you know, from 97 to 2010, the, the average spend on the NHS was going up, or healthcare more generally, was going up by about 6% a year. When the Conservatives came in in 2010, that dropped to zero under Cameron and I think under Theresa May as well. Oddly enough, under Boris Johnson, it started to go up a little bit, but only up to about 2%. So that's 14 years of serious underfunding that is going to have to take, be taken care of at some point. And yet the Conservative government will be constantly telling us that they're spending more on the NHS than ever before. Some people saying, well, that's weasel words because the size of the economy is bigger, well, the population is bigger. Of course, it's going to be bigger. It doesn't mean that you're proportionate proportionally spending more. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that obviously we've seen change, you know, more slowly over time is the sort of demographic shifts in this country. People are living longer, which means that they might require more health treatment. So the pressures on the NHS are getting greater almost every year, despite the sort of innovations and digi digitization of the systems. I think one of the sort of big unanswered questions from today was also on social care. Yeah. Where Streeting alluded to it and said, you know, we need to forge a cross-party consensus and if and when we get into government, we will seek to do that. But he then made a very pointed comment about the Conservatives maybe not being in a fit state to do that when they get there. And, and Mike, of course, social care is so important with this issue because as all uh, people who run hospitals will tell you, one of the main reasons why they 
are at complete capacity in hospitals with all the beds uh, in all the wards completely full is because there are so many people there who could be let out of hospital but need social care at home and there is no social care for those people. You know, they, they need carers to come in and look after them and so on. And that that is having a hugely detrimental impact on the NHS and hospitals particularly. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is also true that we have fewer beds capacity than comparable nations. You know, mm. this came out in the pandemic. We've got far fewer beds per capita than, say, Germany, Spain, France, you know, and many other countries in Western Europe and around the world as well. So we do need more beds. But you are right, we do have lots of people in beds in hospitals who could be put into social care, but the social care isn't available for them. Um, the NHS change. has been criticised. Uh, sorry, why do I keep saying that? Uh, Labour Party has been criticised um, a lot in the last few months for not coming out with any plans on social care, and they keep saying it'll be in the manifesto. It'll be in the manifesto. I mean, politically, this is understandable. You remember that Theresa May came out with her social care plan, which then got derided yes. as being the dementia tax, which is one of the reasons why 2017 didn't work out well for her. One of the many reasons why 2017 didn't work out well for her. So, understandably, political parties coming towards the general election are cautious about putting very clear plans out there because to be fair solving social care is going to cost a lot of money yeah. that money is going to have to come from somewhere it's perfectly understandable that the Labour Party and the Conservative Party maybe don't want to have that conversation you know in its entirety ahead of a general election but I think West Street is exactly right to say that there needs to be cross-party consensus because what you don't want is this turning into a political football issue between Labour and the Conservatives over time because in the end we need a functioning social care system in this country we really don't have it and or do you think we will see cross-party consensus? Because that's what a lot of people have been calling for, you know, calling for a, um, you know, a meeting of minds where e even all the small parties, as well as the Labour Party and Conservatives, would sit together, come up with a policy and agree it. It happens so rarely, though. Yes, I, I mean, I sort of worry that we'll all be at the age where we might need social care before it's finally fixed. Um, but... It sort of depends on, I suppose, the extent to which parties are willing to cooperate after the general election, potentially also on the size of Keir Starmer's majority. If he's yeah. got an absolutely thumping majority, then it wouldn't be hard to sort of put through Parliament. And again, the Conservatives might understand that it's for the sort of long-term interests. But again, I think Mike's point about kind of taxes, there is general consensus that people seem more willing to pay higher taxes in order for improved public services, and probably with that comes public benefits as well. So we saw the creation of the hypothecated uh, social care tax, which obviously got axed by Rishi Sunak. Could Labour bring something back like that again? And of course, Reform UK brought out uh, their NHS plans today, their health service plans, saying that they would basically take all the money that would have gone uh, on green levies or on uh, you know, net zero, and they would be ploughing that money uh, into uh, the NHS. Although they seem to have backtracked over the last few years, where they used to talk much more openly about some sort of privatisation in the NHS, that stuff seems to have been shelved, Mike. I mean, understandably, because if you talk about privatising the NHS, that's probably one of the many, you know, one of the top three things that you could say to the general public, which would dissuade everybody from voting for you. Um, however, I think it's important to say that Reform UK aren't going to win any seats in the next parliament under any, you know, conceivable scenario. So what their policies are are hugely relevant. They're probably more relevant because what they're trying to do, of course, is set themselves apart from the Conservative Party and win votes from the Conservative Party. Yeah.